We welcome. You know, we're so glad that many of you are able to take the time out during this quarantine, you know, to be part and take part in our panel. Um, we're, we're running a little behind as we're dealing with tech issues as usual, you know, in this unique time, you know, but we can use technology like this one, the Zoom, where we can visually see one another, interact and, and also learn, which is what we're here about. Um, I've had a chance to attend a handful of panels over the last few weeks that I normally wouldn't have been able to, you know, either due to time or even like distance. Um, you know, and usually I'm not, I might not be in the same state or even in the country of some of these panels. And uh, we also wanted to kind of do a shout out because we know from past panels, we've had people from across the nation as well as across the world, you know, hailing as far away from, I think Jen, like there's someone from South Africa last time, right? Yeah. You know? Hey Robin, <laughs> she's again today, we love it. I know, which is, you know, which I think right now is probably the dead of night. So anyone who's waking up in the middle of the night for this, you know, their special dedication, kudos going to you. Um, okay, so if we can go to the slides, like the panel overview, obviously, you know, everyone who's here knows what this panel is about. You know, what we wanted to just kind of highlight, if you can look on the bottom about the business of creating is feel free to follow us on Facebook at the business of creating or Instagram at business of creating. Um, we also are on LinkedIn if you search Business of Creating, and we also have a hashtag um, where you can follow us. And we, we post things there about the upcoming panels, but that's also where we will post um, the link thanks to the Writers Guild Foundation when this is all said and done. In case you miss certain things and want to rehear it, we will have that link in the next few days for you to be able to see it, but we'll be doing it through those social channels. Um, so with the Writers Guild Foundation, first of all, there's a few things we want to say and thank people for is, um, we have a wonderful partner with these panels with Writers Guild Foundation. We'd like to do them a shout out, but also we'd like to do a shout out to Final Draft, which is a screenwriting software program, um, which hopefully with this being the Writers Guild Foundation, people are very aware of what you know Final Draft is, but Final Draft is actually generously giving out two full downloads and two mobile apps for free, um, which we will hand out. You know, and you'll, you'll be able to do so if you watch this entire panel. And um, we'll put a link into the, the section to fill out a survey and we will randomly choose four winners. Again, two full downloads and two mobile apps um, that people can win and we'll notify you in a, a couple days afterwards. But, um, but one of our great partners here is obviously the Writers Guild Foundation who hosts these with us here and which we're very thankful for. Normally we do this in person at their library, but we would like to um, turn it over to Dustin um, because Dustin will give a little bit more background for those unfamiliar with the foundation as well as the library. I don't know if Dustin, are you there or are you still I in? am here. Oh, yeah, perfect. Hi. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Dustin. I'm with the Writers Guild Foundation. Um, we hope all of you are staying safe uh, during our stay at home orders um, or wherever you are in the country or across the world. Um, so, the Writers Guild Foundation, we are the nonprofit arm of the Writers Guild of America West here in Los Angeles. Uh, we provide several resources for emerging and aspiring screenwriters. Um, I want to say kind of our um, biggest uh, resource is going to be our library. Um, we, have a, uh, we have thousands of scripts from produced TV shows and movies that you can read on site at our library when we're typically open. Right now we're closed due to the ongoing pandemic. Um, but when we are open, we do uh, offer a library that anyone can come in and read their favorite scripts from their favorite movies or TV shows on site. We're not a loaning library, unfortunately, due to copyright issues. Right now, the library is actually um, answering questions about like formatting your spec script through a blog post series that we have on our blog at wgfoundation.org forward slash blog. If you have any questions about a particular script, you can also email them at library at wgfoundation.org. Um, that's sort of like our email line uh, for any questions currently. Um, we also host events. We've been doing uh, online conversations since the beginning of this pandemic. We do in-person events typically throughout the year when we're not in a pandemic. Um, and all those online conversations are actually recorded. This one is also going to be recorded and will be published on our blog at the end of the week. You can view all of our online conversations, again, at our blog. So if you missed anything that was going on within the past, gosh, two months now, I think, uh, you can go on our blog and visit that. We also have several uh, community programs. We have a veterans writing project where we bring in a uh, class of military veterans, and uh, they are paired with a WGA mentor to workshop and pitch uh, a project of theirs over the course of a year. Um, you can learn 
all about our community programs, our library, and our events at our website, which again is wgfoundation.org. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our panelists and moderator. Thank you, Dustin. And I just want to underscore what he just said, too, is that if you have not had the chance to visit the library, obviously do so after the quarantine, please do so. Many people always tell me is like when they get there, they said it's this hidden gem, you know, and they want to go there a lot more frequently when they get the chance. So please feel free to do so. Um, if we could go up one more, Jen, I know you're scrolling. <laughs> it's I my way of saying, let's go. I want to hear from I these know. people. I'm we, warming up my hands and my wrists are, so I can take some are. notes. Well, there we do. So I, I do, I mean, we can go through this really quick, you know, just so Jen and I, this is the two of us you see here, and we co-founded this two years ago. Um, and Jen runs Beautiful Day Productions, which focuses on comedy and sci-fi. Um, she's a very talented writer with scripts like Do Over, which is a comedy, and Animal Magnetism, <laughs> a sci-fi. If you ever want to learn more, you definitely have to reach out to her. Um, for me, I, I'm a studio marketing exec, having worked in entertainment companies and a bunch of studios, but I'm just very passionate about helping content creators make their projects more commercial, and I'm helping a lot of indie filmmakers do that, and that's um, very often through pitch decks and creating, creating strategy decks and overall marketing distribution advice, but you can find me on LinkedIn if you ever want to contact me. Um, for what Jen shows here is we, this will be, today's is our 16th panel, actually. Um, we've done, second um, virtual one, second virtual one, virtual, yay. Oh, yes, you're right. And I mean, it's been across like unit photography, to PR, to development, to obviously even doing one on financing, um, but just across multiple, you know, topics. And if you guys ever have any topics you want to make sure that we do cover, please let us know because we're always glad to do so. Um, the one, the final slide I just wanted to let you know about is just so you guys know, you know, this, this panel is meant to be interactive. So we want you to ask questions, you know, but please ask the questions in the QA section. You'll see there's a QA section on the bottom and then there's a chat section. Do it in the QA section. The chat section, you know, please we get to know each other very often when we do these in person. There's a lot of networking that goes on and we encourage people to interact and network with another, with one another, reach out to each other. We're all in this together and are here to help one another. Um, so please do so in the chat and reach out and ask the questions in QA. And, and I, Dustin, I'll remind people like in the chat section, there is the rules of conduct so that the Writers Guild Foundation set up. So make sure you follow those as well. But with that said, I'm throwing it to Jen. Woohoo, thank you, Michael. Moderator. All right, so you guys, I was checking out our chat questions already, which um, now I can't get off my screen. Uh, intriguing. Anyway, obviously here we're learning today to learn about financing for indie projects. We have some fabulous panelists, you guys. Uh, I hope you've you know warmed up your hands and your wrists because you're going to be taking a lot of notes today. Everybody, let's welcome first off Todd Olson, president of International at Highland Film Group. Todd has over 20 years of experience. He's expert on everything international. We're talking sales, production, and financing. He's now with Highland Film Group, uh, which has success across a wide range of film genres and platforms, building a reputation for handling high-octane films in the action thriller horror space, focusing on cast director filmmaker-driven content. Everybody, clap from your homes, please. Do some virtual clapping for Todd Olson. Yay! <laughs> hey, Todd. Right there in the middle there is Joseph Lanius. Everybody, Joseph Lanius, founding partner of Lanius Law & Associates. He's going to take us through all those scary things of financing contracts and everything. So Joseph is an entertainment attorney and executive producer, playing a part in bringing over 100 films to the big screens, you guys. So he's got some knowledge for us. Uh, through his domestic and international financing sources, distribution connections, and business and legal expertise in entertainment. He specializes in distribution, finance, investment, and financial structuring. So the scary stuff, everybody. Get a couple cookies so you have something sweet while you're taking down this reality. Uh, and production legal affairs, as well as being business strategist and financial consultant for independent motion picture and other media and technology content. Everybody, round of applause for Joseph! <laughs> Rounding out our panel of experts, it's Amanda Marshall. Amanda, yay! Amanda is the president of Cold Iron Pictures. She nurtures, develops, and produces high-quality independent films, so 10 million and under, if I remember correctly, with talented up-and-coming filmmakers. 
hello a lot of our audience today. This is gonna be great. Uh, Amanda has produced multiple festival and independent spirit award darlings. We've heard of these, of course. Swiss Army Man with Daniel Radcliffe. Mike Birbiglia's Don't Think Twice. Diary of a Teenage Girl and Being Frank, starring one of my faves, award-winning comedian Jim Gaffigan. Everybody, let's welcome Amanda Marshall. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Let's jump right in. As you know, if you've been to our panels before, the first few minutes are kind of a review. Look what happened last season on our show. Let's get a few definitions going on, and then let's do a deep dive into the scary, deep, murky depths of all these good things. Okay, everybody, let's look through these. Debt financing. Um, am I kind of reading these off? Do we already have anything else we want to say? Uh, I'll go. Okay, so debt financing, financing for the picture in the form of a loan against pre-sales and tax incentives. Again, these are the quick definitions so that then we can dive into them further and we're not trying to remember what these are. Equity financing, financing the form of at-risk capital cash. So that's, you know, your auntie and your uncle and all those family members who want to give you their credit card numbers. Give them to me as well. Gap financing, debt financing. So the beginning part there. Uh, provided based on sales estimates for the unsold territories. Pre-sales, pre obviously meaning before, so the distribu distribution agreements entered into prior to closing the debt financing. PPM, private placement memorandum, usually only necessary for slate financing, which we know is when we're doing a whole boatload of films, not just the one. Strike price, the level of financing required by the completion guarantor in order to complete and deliver the picture. And of course, some of our favorites, the tax incentives, debt financing provided against tax incentives from the state of the shooting location. We see that a lot for Georgia and we used to see it more for California and others. All right, I'm on to my next slide, y'all, are you ready? What kind of financing works for my project? Okay, so what is your project actually? Let's, let's go through you guys. We, did, we didn't come to hear my voice. Let's talk, what, what kind of financing is going to work? Um, I'll take this one. Thank you, Todd. To get it going. And um, even though financing tends to put people to sleep and a lot of creative people are like, oh, you know, uh, I'll leave that to somebody else, the numbers guy. Well, That's you why you guys decide. are here. Even though you've spent eight years writing the script and it's a beautiful story of your aunt and what happened with her and her husband who was estranged and then went to war and overseas and was it, whatever the story is, you have to be realistic about what that is and what the value is. Because the kind of financing that you'll need is, is critical to understand your own project. So if you have a genre project that's action, that's sci-fi, that's thriller, those are easy things that tend to work across the board. They also work around the globe. Uh, Netflix has found this out and now looks for those pretty exclusively because they work across all um, sort of cultures. If you have a really small story that's, that's beautiful, it's fantastic, or that's very arty, very art house, kind of quirky, all of those things, it tends to be that you won't be able to finance those very easily, particularly if you're new, um, with debt financing, because the people who put up the money debt want someone to tell them for sure this thing will sell. With those kind of movies, they tend to be, hey, if it comes out great, wow, it's fantastic and gets a festival launch and uh, everybody does well. That's, those are very rare. So those, the kind of financing you need for that kind of story would probably be in the uh, equity range. It would be the rich aunt, the, somebody else who's really into that. There's a lot of investors who actually like to go into those kind of art house edge, edgy kind of projects. Everything else um, can be backed into using debt uh, facilities in a, in a meaningful way. So you really have to decide where your project sits for real. Don't kid yourself, even though you think it's fantastic. And let a few other people read it. Um, who you respect, but that will tell you truthfully what it is, not just, wow, it's so great. It's such a great story. And then think about it in realistic terms and look at how many of those films you see around you on HBO, on Netflix, on Amazon, in the theaters, and, and how they're marketed um, to figure out where your film sits in there. That's really how you could be realistic about it and, and where it sits in the spectrum of, of product to kind of decide how to attack your financing strategy. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to move on to financing strategy. Look at this. We're looking at backing into a sensible and strikable budget. As you can see, you guys, it's a bit 
you know, free flowing conversation. We've got our points up there, but they go back and forth, you know? So, um, I act, yeah, let's just jump on in. So budgeting, back into a sensible and strikeable budget. Um, talk with me more. So how am I going to be backing into the budget? I mean, I know we were talking about in some of our terms here about, you know, pre-sales and tax incentives and et cetera. And, you know, you guys, I'm sure everybody has some bits in common with their financing strategies, but then depending on the budget range, as you were saying, the quirkier ones, I mean, I want to hear from Amanda about that since I know that's her zone uh, as far as the equity budgets versus, you know, multi-strand kind of a thing. But yeah. I want to always hear from everybody. You know. for, for your projects that fall more into that second category, the, the ones that play at Sundance, the execution dependent ones, um, you know, I think when you're backing into a budget, you, it's also like being realistic about what are the elements. So if you have a list cast, that's certainly going to help and increase the value of a project. But if you have a first time director with actors that aren't known, you know, there's your budget better be pretty low um, because it's just not realistic to for a financier to to back it. They're backing it based off of sales estimates or um, you know, the marketplace and a lot of those films, plus even when they're have named talent, if it's a first time filmmaker, you still don't know exactly how, or a quirky story, you still, it's all going to be about how that film ultimately ends up. And without a pr proven track records are definitely something that people look for to feel secure. <laughs> um, if you don't have that, then you have to be realistic about how much money you're going to raise. And so then are you, in addition to, you know, asking mom and dad, you know, kind of for credit card numbers, and I'm being a little silly about it because these are scary things to discuss. Uh, but so in addition to that, I'm assuming you're looking for like the tax incentives and other things of that. Yeah, the more money that you can have that feels safe, uh, the easier it's going to be. So can you shoot in a tax incentive state? Can you get grants? Um, when you're talking about budgets that are you know, 2 million and under those, a grant can make a huge difference. Um, when, and obviously tax credit can matter no matter what size your budget is. Mm -hmm. And is that something then that Joseph and Todd, you've, you know, you, you look for as much as the lower budget projects would to be something for the tax incentives? I, I haven't seen, uh, I mean, Joseph will tell you too, but we, I, I mean, I haven't seen a film that hasn't utilized tax incentives. There's the rare film that gets done in LA that can't get yeah. a tax incentive here, but it's done because the talent will do it without traveling. So they can go home every night. And so they'll work two weeks on your movie, mm -hmm. uh, but you're paying full bore. So you have to figure out other ways to save money to get the budget down to make, make it make sense. Mm -hmm. But Joseph will tell you, I mean, he spends a lot of time putting together money against tax credits yeah i mean i will say yeah the i would say about 90 percent of the films i do have some sort of a tax credit uh, component financing just because it's easy quote unquote free money in ways um and very hard to do like todd said you have those ones occasionally here on that 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 do crew up and film in california but i would say those are usually projects that are uh, lower than one and a half million, maybe even a million, just because of, of the factors that Todd said. You don't have to travel as much. You don't have to have as much housing. Uh, so you, you know, and you may be able to have other favors here and there that, that make sense for you to stay local rather than traveling. But in all, you know, I would say if you're doing something north of a million, you should probably look, be looking for a, a, a state that has tax incentives um, you know, obviously, just to give you guys an idea of some of the hot states and, uh, you know, Georgia and Louisiana are always there, but sometimes you do run into problems crewing up. Uh, you know, some of the good states to work in, especially if you're doing a picture that's, uh, you know, 5 million and under, maybe even 10 million and under, mm -hmm. Alabama and Mississippi are quite good, uh, New Mexico. Um, Kentucky and Utah both have decent... Yeah, Kentucky and Utah, um, because the other thing is sometimes in, in Utah, you can avoid uh, going non-union, which will, or going union with IATSE, which will significantly help your budget. Um, you yeah, know. that's good too. 
Yeah. Well, New York, you definitely have to, you know, you're definitely going IOTC and, sure. and I will say it, 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 well, if you're in upstate New York, it's really good. Um, uh, but filming in the city can be quite, you know, expensive. Um, you know, and I would recommend, uh, I recently had a film that shot in Alabama that d was doubling as New York. So right. that gives you the idea of if you can get creative of, of what you can make different spots, you know, seem to be. Even the studios will do Toronto for New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just got to think out of the box sometimes. I know uh, the president of production at Warner Brothers, a friend of mine, and he said these days he spends maybe 35% of his time figuring out the best tax credit. You're talking about a $200 million movie and they want to shoot in Australia or South Africa or somewhere like that because you're, they're still pulling the same 25%. And if that's 25% of 200 million versus 25% of 2 million, it still means the same in the overall picture. And on the small movies, you have to like, you balance it because if you're traveling, if you're going to a state where there's no crew and there's no actors, you're housing everybody, you're putting everybody up. A lot of that money that you're, spending has nothing to it will never it's not ending up on screen so on your small movies you have to balance it's still probably going to make sense to go there but choose the ones that are that make sense creatively balanced with what makes sense from a budget perspective i've definitely done projects that have been rewritten for a tax incentive state whether it to be shot as that state or to double um as another spot and then i've made movies like um swiss army man actually got the, the california tax credit if that movie had not gotten the tax credit, I don't know how that movie would have gotten made. It would have been very difficult. Um, there were a lot of benefits to um, shooting in California where there was a crew base that we felt was really important to use um, and a lot of favors we could pull in in California. So it just made sense to, to do it here. Thank, thankfully we got the tax credit because otherwise the other option was like Puerto Rico, which didn't make any sense because if I'm bringing everyone into Puerto Rico, why am I shooting in Puerto Rico? So. You have to balance all of that. Yeah, Amanda, just, uh, um, Jen, I'm just going to jump in with some questions if you're okay with yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm pulling up our slides at so, the same yeah, so time. Amanda, so Amanda, there's actually a three, there's, a, there's three questions. One, I'm going to start off with Amanda, if you look in the side. Um, and I just also want to say, Elsie and Trenton, I see your questions there. We're going to, we have a, a separate slide, which will address some of those questions and ask those. But Amanda, um, a few minutes ago, and this is from Julius. He says, Amanda, you just said your budget better be pretty low. Is 500,000 what you mean or, or lower? What do you, you know? No, I mean, I think you have to balance what is realistic to actually get a, your vision on the screen and what is then, it, it's a balance. Um, it doesn't have to be $500,000. On a $500,000 movie, you have a whole other level of constraints that you have to think about. It, it, it has to be the right budget for the movie. And if you, some movies don't make any sense at $500,000. So you will never be able to execute something that people <laughs> will want to watch. <laughs> yeah. um, and then some movies make perfect sense. If you have a contained movie and it's just a couple of actors and um, you have the resources to get something really great on screen, there's plenty of wonderful movies that have been made that way. It, you just have to think about it in terms of like what makes sense and you will have to make sacrifices no matter what. It doesn't matter how much money, $10 million, 12 million, you know, movies make sacrifices. So it's just about like what, what sacrifices you're willing to make um, that don't compromise the movie too much, but still get it made. Okay. Just, okay you guys look at this. Uh, can I move forward? Because I saw some of our questions were, were stuff we're already going to cover. Or um, do, I'm sorry, Michael, do we have something else? Yeah, I think it was more of like there was stuff about like particularly when we're talking about equity, right? You know, and so um, there was uh, the question. Uh, let's see, where did that go? Um, I think we, it's interesting. There was a, quite a few on COVID, so we, I don't know if we want to talk about That's, that now. No, that? we've got that later. We'll do that later. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and then um, I think we're. Okay, so Joseph, this is one of your big moments coming up here. I've given you a preview of the screen, man. Okay, so financing, structuring our investor agreements. Uh-oh, talk to us more. Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I, pen ready. I answered a question from someone in there, but I'll, I'll definitely dive into it a bit more. Awesome. And, you know, uh, and, and I think what I'll go down, you know, what I'll skip to a bit is, is like, yeah, you know, there's, 
there's the uh, there's the concept of doing a slate financing and a single picture financing um, you know, in your slate financing that is, you know, that's obviously you may have five to 10 projects that you're going to, to raise money for. You may or may not have all of those projects necessarily identified. Um, but that's what you're going out for now in that type of a raise. And, and especially if you're casting a very, very wide net, um, you might need a PPM, uh, type of arrangement. And, you know, what a, P, a private placement memorandum is something that, you know, is it's, it, deals with securities and the SEC, um, you know, and now as opposed to a single picture financing where you don't need, a lot of people are under the impression that you need to do a PPM because a PPM can be costly. Like it's, it, you're talking 50 to a hundred thousand dollars, depending on who you're dealing with um, to get all that legal paperwork in place. Uh, whereas, you know, you can do what more, what I do mainly on my pictures, especially on single picture financing, is you have a more simplified investment agreement that, you know, it accomplishes the same goals and, and gives the investor what they want nine times out of 10. Mm -hmm. um, as, you know, they, you know, you spell out how much, you know, what they're investing into, how much they're supposed to see on their return, their net profit share, their credits, um, maybe other little perks like their right to visit set or come to premieres. Uh, and then the big thing you have to have in those agreements are your risk factors. Um, that basically those risk factors are in, in a simplified way say, hey, you're doing this realizing that you may not ever see a penny back. Um, and, and they go into a lot more, but it's a much simpler and cost effective way to get financing for your, your picture where you're not like, you know, going to do that full PPM route um, that is, is much difficult. Uh, kind of in, in line with that is where people get often confused is they're like, okay, we're gonna set up this new production, this new entity that for the production, they sometimes, you know, allow their investors to be a members of that company. I you know, now, unless your investor specifically requests this, I would recommend to highly avoid that because you, you don't want so many cooks in the kitchen now. And that's where it kind of, the, the second bullet point there where it talks about ownership versus revenue, net profit share. Mm -hmm. um, ownership means that you're giving them shares in this company or, you know, and, and, and this is the company that will hold the copyright and kind of manage everything about the production. Um, you know, I would recommend not giving your investors shares into that company because then that makes them a decision maker within that company. And you don't necessarily want an investor making decisions when they're not as familiar with the industry or, you know, and how things work that could impede your progress in the, you know, especially uh, in the future. Whereas you can just say, hey, instead of owning X percent of the, the company, they get X percent of the net profits. And net profits are after the investors have recouped all their money and premium. And, you know, that's the same type of net profits that you may give to a cast. Uh, you may give to a director, a writer, a producer. Um, but it's a much safer and easier way for the production and, and especially those who really are running the production and need to make some decisions, decisions to manage everything and move forward and not be bogged down with too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you can now, don't get me wrong. If somebody's come and say, Hey, I'm gonna give you a, you know, a, a couple million dollars, but I gotta be a member of this company then, you know, it might be worth you saying like, okay, let's just figure this out and work it out. Um, yeah. I'm just saying in an ideal scenarios, you want to keep as many people out as possible. But, you know, at the same time, I don't, you know, I don't turn down money very often. But there is bad money. <laughs> <laughs> you want to get it made. Okay, and see, we've got a nice list of stuff here. That's why I've still got this slide up, everybody. Items to have in place prior to raising the financing. I mean, so I can't just go to y'all today and go, can I have some money? You know, blank check, just sign it. I, I can't do that. You're not going to just do that for us? 
if, if I may, I'll touch on the first one, and then I, you know, I know Amanda and, and Todd could probably, but weigh in on some of these other things to include in there. Um, but clean chain of title is probably the biggest and most important thing, and what that means is you obviously, you know, ha you know, you have the script. That's a piece of that's the IP. Um, where it gets sometimes confusing is, you know, everybody gets in there, they're all friendly and, 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 you know, participating and they may be throwing ideas to develop the script and, you know, change this and change that. Well, unfortunately, every idea that contributes from a third party that gets into that is technically that own, that third party owns that idea. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have an agreement in place with that third party, um, prior to you guys, everyone really collaborating, that could cause future problems because all of a sudden you go and get some financing and then you have, you know, this guy, someone out of the woodwork raising their hand saying, uh, I own part a piece of this property. So you need to figure out a deal with me or I'm going to go file a claim. And if you have a claim filed against your picture, you're not going to get distribution you know, you won't, you know, the, you, you may, you know, if you don't have the financing, you're definitely not getting financing. So it's very important, when, especially when you're collaborating with other people in the development stage to have a firm understanding. And, and I highly recommend at least, even if it's a simple term sheet, having uh, something in place that protects you, that says everything that they contribute, you own the rights to, and then, to the extent that they are entitled to any kind of compensation or something that's at least spelled out or at least as you'll discuss in good faith. But the, the key thing is making sure you actually have agreements in place beforehand, because I cannot tell you countless number of times people have come to me, Hey, I have this problem. I need you to help me with. And I'm like, did you sign anything? <laughs> yep. Let me see it. Oh no. Um, it happens a lot. So, you know, just be, I know everybody is, is friends and especially when that creative energy is going on, it can kind of get lost, but I highly recommend always trying to take care of business, even if that costs a, a little bit of money of the, on the upfront, because it could save you a lot of money in the long run. I would say, um, the general, like, like Joseph said, I would say, um, it's good to think, never assume you're going to be friends at the end of all of this. Um, uh there's going to be a moment when you're not <laughs> and it's like a roller coaster. Hopefully it'll come back around and you're all friends at the end, but there'll definitely be a moment when you're not. So it's best to just assume that and just lay it all out at the beginning. Cause it's definitely going to be, a, a, you'll need less lawyers. You'll spend less on legal and, and everyone will know what they're getting into. And it, it won't be a surprise because a lot of times, that you can't assume that you all have the same um, ideas. It's called well, paperwork, people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good to have it on paper, then nobody has to have any issue around it. Absolutely. And the title Absolutely. is critical. That's right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Just make sure, you know, just say, hey, let's do this paperwork, get it out of the way, and then you can get on to the creative. But you got to do that so that it, you're lining it up all properly. Absolutely. When you're going to raise yeah. financing and having these other things, the reality of it is most money people who are approached for, for money for films, they've been approached a dozen times. And most of the ones that like to play in that arena, I mean, Joseph will tell you, they're the same people. They invest in a film here, one here, one here, whatever. They like doing that. They have money they made in gas and electric or they made it in some other you know, startup. Who knows? There's a, a variety of people that put money into movies. Sometimes it's a group of dentists. That's who funded uh, Cabin Fever when we were doing it back then, way back. And they believed in Eli Roth, who no one ever heard of, and his practical special effects guy and everybody else and decided to put the money in. And then later they made an incredible amount of money. But the, the reality is those guys were brought in by some producers who actually knew what they were doing. They were able to show this is where we think the budget's going to sit. This is what we've done. This is what the schedule would look like. Here's the finance plan in terms of how we think we're going to back into this budget. We have X number of dollars coming from a tax credit. We have 
X number of dollars, you know, committed uh, in a post uh, post production deal where I'm getting two hundred thousand dollars of post per credit. I got a music deal with Cutting Edge or Cherry Lane or whoever is going to do the music. So I backed into all these things. So literally, this is what my shortfall is at the moment, not including fees. And here's what our projections are from international sales. And you have this plan, and you understand what that is. If you have that, and then you say now. Look at this script. Look at my director's rip reel. This is the shit. This project's so incredible, and you pitch the creative. They're much more comfortable and more believing. If you just go in and pitch creative, and then they go, well, what's the budget? Well, we haven't really done that yet. <laughs> but we're going to, and, um, or where are you going to shoot this? Well, we haven't decided, uh, you know, we don't know yet. Or who's going to be, you know, who, who's the cast? Well, we think it might be. So you really kind of get your ducks in a row if you're talking to money people because they don't, they're going to believe, you know, they get approached by a variety of people like Shark Tank who are pitching them to do different ideas to make money. If you consider it to be like that, you have to know what you're doing when you go in there. And it does behoove you and benefit you to have gone through each of these things, got the budget, the production schedule, your finance plan, your shooting locations, you put together a terrific deck that looks really great. You have your director do that work in that time, either to do a rip matic or to do an incredible deck with styles of, of you know, with images that, that paint the story the way he wants to do it. That's really important. And then sales estimate, as early as you can, if you have a viable commercial film, approach a number of sales agents and ask, tell them about it, what you want to do. Here's my short list of cast. What do you think this would do? Even off the cuff, they'll give you a number, whether they do full-blown projections or not. And right away, you're gonna kind of know where your movie sits. If sales company A, B, C, D all tell you that that's probably gonna do about maybe a million, million and a half out of foreign, or if they all tell you it's doing an easy three and a, you know, somewhere three to five, you know what's up. If one tells you it's doing five million and every other one tells you it's sub a million, you know where you are. Well, you're gonna smoke by the five million guy. But it's important. Because when you have open those discussions with a sales company, and believe me, they'll take a meeting or they'll take a call, and you you tell them what you have, what you're planning to do. If it's legit and you really know what you're talking about, and you've done some of this legwork, then they'll participate with you by giving you some rough estimates based on what you're telling them. Or they'll tell you, "Hey, I'm sorry, but if you're putting Travolta in that, it's not eight million. You're never going to get there." If Travolta's in, it's like maybe two out of four and another mill domestic. You're never going to get to the eight. So they'll give you a realistic picture of what you're having in mind cast-wise, too. And that's fantastic. So sorry to clarify, uh, I'm, I'm loving all these, you know, action items that people should be dashing down as quickly as they can. And I, I appreciate the fact that you're saying, hey, go talk to the sales companies, you know, get, get your ducks in a row as much as you can even if you don't have cast and director signed on the line, you've got your idea of what you want and here's the few you know, that you're going to be approaching. And I appreciate that you're saying, hey, go talk to sales companies now. You don't have to wait until you're knee deep in all of it. You should be getting all, that's part of getting the ducks in the row before you even go to financiers. Absolutely. Because it, you, you'll, you'll get to that, and then eventually, if you develop a relationship there, they'll give you some more info. And at some point, if they think it is viable, they'll give you real numbers. And th having that in hand when you go to look for money, that tells them right away. It's like the good housekeeping seal of approval. If mm -hmm. somebody's showing some numbers from a company that's a legit company that says this is what we think it can do, your money guys are going to be all altogether more comfortable. Absolutely. We've done our homework. We show that we're, we know some of the steps we need to take. I have a feeling, Todd, you're going to be getting a lot of phone calls and emails in the near future. Right? <laughs> Wait till after virtual can. I'm buried right now. I can imagine. Amanda, I'm sorry. I, I started to cut you off there earlier, please. So I was going to say, and that is backing into a reasonable budget, because if you have a 2 million in foreign sales, and there's also the asks versus the takes, like, you can have like a low end estimate and a high end estimate. And if you're on your foreign sales and if you're trying to make a $5 million movie that is only worth 1 million in foreign, uh, then that's not a realistic budget. <laughs> you're making a million dollar movie and considering everything else upside. Um, yeah. So you have to, those numbers will help also like 
set help reality set in as to like what you really could be doing. Yeah, it might not be 200 million. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. Absolutely. Okay, I think we've talked about, you know, the majority of what we need here. I'm skipping over our, our investor presentation deck because look what we have coming up here. The presentation deck, everybody. All right. I know we've got so much on these slides. Normally I like to pull them down in between, but we got a lot to be looking at here. Okay, because I know we know more about marketing decks, right, Michael? So I'm, I'm so excited that we can find out what's the difference between the marketing and the financing decks to be whipping up. So everybody, you got some more homework coming up, fixing your presentation deck for financing. Tell me more. What do we need to include, why? Um, Some of them, I think, are pretty, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, it's pretty, you know, self, yeah. uh, self-explanatory on the synopsis. You know, the producer team, you know, you got to remember a lot of investors out there, you know, while they may love the project and, and what it's all about, they're also, you know, uh, every investor would tell you they invest, most investors invest in people. Mm -hmm. um, so they want to know who is spending their money. And, you know, so it's it's always good to have, and look, the more people you can have that have maybe done this in the deck, you know, that have in your deck, you know, uh, that are veteran producers or at least done it a couple of times or veteran, you know, maybe you already have, even if it's uh, someone that maybe is, a, is a, you know, your DP or a high level um, crew member, you know, uh, good to in include those just so that people know like who the team is and who, the, who is surrounding it, um, you know, kind of. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one thing to really include and, and don't be shy, you know, but boast about everything you've done, even if it's outside of the film industry to give them comfort, to know that you're a responsible, you know, person and, and you're not going to go buy um, a mansion in Beverly Hills with the money. Uh, um, now, Joseph, a quick question, mm -hmm. um, because earlier you were saying, you know, as far as having ownership of a project, you know, don't have too many cooks. Um, is that the same as far as, you know, is there a, a specific number that you don't, you know, that would be like the minimum, the maximum of people that you want to be bragging about on your team or is no, it? No, no, because, because you don't, you may own that copyright, but it doesn't mean that every person that's on your team necessarily, you know, is a, in, in, is owning a piece of that copyright. They can be attached through an agreement, you know, whether that's a, a producer agreement, an EP agreement, um, whatever that may be and not necessarily be an owner of that company. Uh, you know, that's kind of, it's, it's, it depends on the nature of the creatives involved at that stage, but you may have people want, you know, like, you know, sometimes I'm on a deck. I don't own that copyright. I'm not, you know, a creative, I'm not a writer, but it's just, you know, with my, I, I just bring some, credibility to projects here and there depending you know by providing the legal um and to some degree uh, and so there's you know there's that aspect of it all um you know again that is another thing though too it's just like if you can as much as possible um control that ip and own that copyright on your own and engage people that are, are going to wind up working on the picture or collaborating with you through agreements versus making them a member of the company, it's always a much, you know, it can be a, an easier process. Um, mm -hmm. Again, that, you know, it may be set up different. So, um, you know, that that's how you manage that because just because they're on your deck doesn't necessarily mean that they're, it, it, it usually means they're going to be a part of the picture in, 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 in some role, but it doesn't mean they're necessarily an owner of the company. Okay. Um, and so then, I like how if, you know, the director's attached, put the person on, cast list. I like how, again, you know, sensible wish list as opposed to these people have already signed on the dotted line. That's kind of nice to know that you can go like, well, these are who I see for it. Well, also, it's like, you know, even going back to the sensible part of it, what we kind of discussed earlier, you know, it's like if you're doing a $5 million project, Tom Cruise is not sensible to be on your wish list. <laughs> you know, he's, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think he rolls over in bed for $5 million, um, uh, much less st will step on your set for, you know. So it's also, yeah, like, you know, having a good cast list based on your budget, you know, that makes sense. And again, you may or may not get these people and you can have a few that are maybe, 
you know, you're kind of fishing and reaching for, but, you know, I would say, you know, limit that to one where the other ones are like, okay, they're relatively sensible, you know, and they, they could probably, you know, you could see them in this type of a project um, where, you know, uh, in, in, like I said, Brad Pitt, you know, Tom Cruise, if you're, if your project's not 20 minutes and above, you know, it's like, you're not going to get them. Um, and, and even then, good luck. How many um, should we have on the list for like, you know, our main characters, two, three? I would say three is usually a decent number for, mm -hmm. you know, and, and three maybe, to five is okay. But yeah. I've seen, I literally seen, and this is from real producers and real directors, a laundry list that the email's so long, it's like three pages of names. They, like, they just sent their casting director's list. They just <laughs> who sent this? I mean, it's so absurd. It's like, first of all, about 40% of them I never heard of. And then the ones I have heard of, they're not ever going to do this movie. You know, like sending a laundry list, just might as well. I can go to IMDb Pro, too, and pull like a thousand names. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, I want to know somebody's thought about it. Because I know how cast works, particularly on a smaller budget. Call it anywhere the one and a half to five the director in the room with the cast has to convince them that they were made to do this role. And it has to be like that. So if that director has no an idea of who's going to play the role, it's just, you're, you're, it's really tough. So I, when I see laundry lists, it just means no one's put any effort into really thinking about who that should be. And if I see like, you know, three to five reasonable names, usually the one sticks out that's creatively right for it but might be a challenge. And then there are two more that could work for sure and at least get the financing halfway home. I love it. We've got some good practical advice with, you know, I mean, hello, do your homework, right? Think of the three to five that are gonna be good choices and then you're gonna be taking us much more seriously because we have at least some vague idea of what we're talking about when we're coming to you guys. Okay, uh, investment overview plus budget, including top sheet if available. Uh-oh, we got some serious vocabulary words there, team. Yeah, we, what I'm what is meant kind of by investment overview is just giving your you know like your investors like okay we're raising this much money and you know you may you know say like okay we're raising five million dollars and we were taking in increments of two hundred and fifty k like if anybody's lower than that I don't you know you don't whatever um, and then you know kind of spelling out like their return on investment usually on equity you see it. 15 to 20 percent um is the you know so if i invest a million dollars i'm going to get 20 percent on that money before anybody shares in the net other profits of the picture mm -hmm. um so it's that and then when it comes to the budget it's like look at this stage it's not got to be a perfect budget but it should at least be in a ballpark of what you're, you're thinking, you know, because again, it could elevate a little bit because you get a cast member that you're going to have to pay more for, but it's worth it. Um, and, you know, so it doesn't have to be a perfect budget, but it should be in the ballpark of what you're expecting. And again, it's just a, a little more, it shows a little more sophistication that you're more prepared and you, you, you know, you have an idea of, of what you're, you're doing. Um, you know, and is so. there like a percentage of the budget that is acceptable to be like, hey, you know, it's going to be five million plus, or, you know, plus perhaps another 10 percent or something. You know, is there like an acceptable percentage amount that people go, yes, 10 percent. Yes, 12 percent. Oh, 13. I don't think so. You know, yeah, I would say early on you could have a 10 to 15 percent variance. Mm -hmm. that shouldn't matter too too much you know again as long as what you're you know you would just want to show that's mainly if that if that variance is probably you know it's just a fine tuning but maybe it's just because of a cast increase you know and it's it's worth it you know what you don't want to see, what they don't want to see is that's a 10 percent variance of money going into the producer's pocket um you know if that's the increase in budget then they may have something to say, but if it's it's going to increase the value of the film and going on screen, then, you know, most don't, you know, bat an eyelash. But, you know, in, in, if somebody's wanting to constrain you and say, hey, I don't want the budget to be this much, you just need to make sure, uh, go over this amount. 
you just need to make sure that's a that's an amount you're really comfortable with that early on kind of constraining yourself to because if not then you're going to have to go back and ask permission to go above that so okay so good i love that what we're talking about with what that means with the overview and you know giving it your best go um okay so distribution plan plus comparables plus sales estimates if available well we already know how to get the sales estimates now so again you guys are going to have very full inboxes coming up in the next few days um so distribution plan tell me more about where we're going to be showing and seeing this wonderful thing and how much popcorn and all of that and then comparables well this is going to be similar to this film this film and this film and you can see all of it on box office mojo etc yes do i have that right or am i so far out of the ballpark that no, doing that? comps is the same they do it you know when i was doing acquisitions at the studio we we had comparable titles both in our own library that we knew what those numbers were and then we had to go out and research outside of that to get a gauge on where this film sat and historically you know things are definitely different because you don't even even in this moment with covid which i'm sure we'll get to but when when uh how a movie moves through the windows and through the media is different than it's ever been in the old days it was you know theatrical video tv that was it now you got all kinds of split windows all over the place and different streamers vying for different windows you got netflix taking the first pay window you got you know amazon taking you know the s slot after that and then everybody lining up behind it everywhere so it's a very different um kind of structure in terms of what the comparable values are and understanding what the rate cards are for the streamers. Most people don't know that. We don't even know Apple's rate card at the moment. They don't really have one because they're not buying direct very much, but they're occasionally buying. So, I mean, there's a variety of um, things to do. I think comparables in the sense of raising money is more about, it's like this film, A, B, and C, um, very much like that, like this in tone, like that in action, like this in cast, whatever, to, to, to build that. Um, what you want to do is give them some comfort level you're making a movie that's like these other movies they've heard of. Mm. Because if, if you're listing movies nobody's heard of, it doesn't really come back to you. So you have <laughs> to figure out which movies that have been out, whether they're out in the 90s or whatever. Mm. Um, and projecting out box office has kind of little value at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's more about this is creatively like these movies and we think it's going to be well and then here's what we think the, the estimates will be about how it will perform worldwide. Okay, and to question, to piggyback on what you were just saying, because you said even if they're from the 90s, because I was always told it should be within the last like four to five years. Ideally, so, but from a creative standpoint, if it's mm -hmm. very much like a film that's got that feel, it's okay to pull from one. In other words, okay. there's, you don't have to pull like, you know, only three films that came out in the last five years, because good luck, most of you aren't going to have a film that's anything like that. Yeah. Or okay. you're going to okay. point to a film that did 400 million or 600 million worldwide, and it's going to look ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> and, you know, and I would so, add to that, that just exactly about the 400 million, like when I see decks that have comps, and they're like, well, this is how much it made at the box office. The truth is, for an independent film, that will not actually matter a whole lot for the investor. <laughs> um, you know, like there's so, you know, the waterfall matters. And so, okay, that doesn't mean that because it made, say, five million at the box office, that that was five million in profit for your investor. So it's like box office is kind of irrelevant to a certain degree, especially in the indie space. And if you're pulling studio comps for your tiny indie movie, like again, the distribution model is gonna be probably pretty significantly different. So again, that's an irrelevant comp. So think of it in terms of like Todd said, the creative. And if you happen to have great comps for movies that were made in a similar budget that then did well, great. Exactly. I love the point of the difference because, you know, I've always been told that you need to get the comp films that either, you know, made a, a nice profit or at least broke even. So it's good to understand that we're looking at it from a more creative standpoint in this instance. 
I oh, think that any, any savvy investor is going to realize that because even that some of the decks I've seen in the old days, they used to list out whatever, you know, they'd say, oh, this movie was made independently and it went on to do $100 million or whatever and the budget was this. And it's like, I knew the actual budget. And it wasn't that at all. And I'm like, where'd you get that info? I mean, yeah. aside from that, you got to remember they only took, you know, the distribution company took their fee off the top. So say that's 20% mostly because of, and then, and that's, and the box office, that's 50% to begin with lopped off by the exhibitor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it drops down directly. And then by the time it feeds back through the waterfall, like Amanda said, it doesn't mean the investors in that pool at the back end saw any more money. So it, and if you've been in it for a while, and a lot of these investors have that put into film, Reality is smarter than trying to do some crazy thing that you think works. And also run your plan, run your financing presentation deck by some people. Mm -hmm. Have them look at it and tell you frankly what they think of it. A lot of times people make these things in a vacuum and then the first time they put it in front of somebody, you know, it just gets put off because it's like not professional. And it's a professional business. That's what it is. It's the business of film. Mm -hmm. And the creative's critical, but you really need this part of it. That's why financing is so important because nothing gets done without it. So you got to figure out how this works. It's the bramble. Okay, great. Thank you, you guys. And so then the SEC disclaimer, I kind of want to jump ahead because I'm looking at our time and I'm enjoying our conversation way too much. I'm listening to everything and I'm going, oh, no, that's the time. So I want to keep going. Um, how's it different from the talent presentation deck? Okay, well, hello, it's the financing one. You're gonna have stuff about financing in it, not necessarily in the talent one. Okay, uh, yeah, so it's gonna have a bit more creativity as far as producer, director, vision statements. Gonna have more creativity about the feel, the mood, and the tone. We kind of discussed that already. Uh, I know a lot of people earlier when I was monitoring the chat, I'm so glad Michael's doing that. Uh, how do we attract financing in the COVID world? Yeah, there's a few, Jen. There's like, I know, and for some reason, I got kicked off because of my <laughs> Wi-Fi, fun times with tech. So a lot of those questions I can't see right now, but I know Madison and Tanisha in the chat, and I don't know if Todd, Amanda, and team, and Joseph, can you just take a look at that for someone who says I can't read it? But there's some questions about, about COVID and the impact that this world is in trying to get financing. It has it changed? You know, and so if you're able to answer just at least those two questions, I think I might answer some of the questions that a lot of people have. But the ones from Madison and Tanisha were the ones that kind of raised their hands in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, Joseph, I don't know what what the projects. I know we're on some projects together. Actually, Joseph's done legal on some of the stuff that we're handling. We had a couple of movies that we shut down in March that were in production. So those are, that's kind of brutal. So in terms of them coming back, we have a slate of pictures going into can. We have two finished, three, three screening, and then we have like four uh, pre-sale pictures. It's all very hush hush, but strong casts on a couple of them that are big. But in terms of theatrical sales for international, which is what these would be at that level, we don't know. We're not sure. And we've got two movies that are big. One was slated to go 1,500 screens in, uh, in July. That's been pulled back. And now it looks like that may not have a theatrical or it'll have a very limited theatrical. So uh, how this financing side of it works going forward is a bit tricky because when are you shooting? Where are you shooting? And, and what we don't even know what IOTC is saying or SAG is saying about the safety of actors and <laughs> crew members going somewhere. So either you're sticking in the States, which probably is the easiest for the moment till they sort out because we were shooting so many things overseas. One was in, you know, shooting in Romania, shooting in Puerto Rico, like Man said, shooting in, the, the, you know, we have it everywhere. We're shooting a movie in Colombia, and they kicked us out. So how to attract financing, I'm unsure because even, even the financers are probably checking their pockets and checking their stocks because in this COVID scenario, everybody took a, took a hit. I think it's sort of stabilized, but now it's like we've got to restart the economy and everything else. So it's a bit tricky. It's good to work out these things while you've got this time, figure out the cast list, get all the creative in line, do all of those things figure out what the budget's going to be learn how to do it yourself even spend some time get movie magic and schedule a movie or schedule a couple you've got a little bit of window of time here to come back and be stronger than before and then you'll i, I think it will resume and get going again 
but it's going to be a little while. And I think you can use the time too to think about it in terms of take a look at that project and analyze it from the world we currently live in. Like if you have, if you're shooting a movie that's traveling all to multiple countries, if you have a movie that's a huge cast and all has tons of crowd scenes, but you didn't have a VFX budget, like <laughs> you aren't making that movie anytime soon. So think about it in terms of what is actually going to be possible at some point in the next year and a half and and really look at your film and, and think about what is reasonable because a financier is going to think about that because if you present a project that's not shootable then why would someone invest in it um, i was no thank you i was noticing from several of the chat questions were similar enough that i'm like okay let me group them together so one was uh basically because it seems to be flip-flopping as far as well now we do want as we have here the contained projects smaller cast uh things that you know are much more genre oriented which at one point were kind of considered the you know n not the mega films that they were the more quiet films and so those you know suddenly those seem to be the gems that we want to go for yeah yeah. We're doing an animation one and a VFX project. And the VFX one, we're going to shoot the exteriors in Utah because we think it's going to be up and running by uh, end of July. Okay. And there's a, there's a controlled environment there to be able to do some of it. It's a space movie, so it's not, you know, you can shoot, most of it's going to be stage-based for the actual, you know, print, for, the, for the photography. But then the rest of the movies, essentially VFX are so much VFX. And the other thing, which we don't do a lot of, we're taking... Um, uh, a big animated title that can too. Oh, I so, and and, uh, yeah, because obviously the the you know like animated projects they're not as nearly as affected by COVID because it's it's everybody you're mainly working, you know, and 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 doing the animation in house at a you know at a desk and rendering and and all that. So there's not nearly as much. And again, your actors are going to studios. Uh, to do voiceovers, and and that's you know it's limited people. Uh, we had actors on this. Do we did a promo for Ken that's being uh, finished now? It's being finished in three countries, by the way, all independent, you know, but working on with the producer to make this promo to to do pre sales for this movie, mm -hmm. and then the cast did the voice work. Same thing from home. They recorded them and and got it right, and then uh, and then have made the promo to it. So yeah, there's that. Yeah, and then I think one, one thing Amanda touched on was really important is like, yeah, take this time to look at your script. Like, do you have like these dialogue scenes with a lot of people that maybe you can condense or maybe they're not as relevant? Because in, right now it's all about, you know, you want as little people in a, in, a, in a scene. And when I, what it means by contained projects is like, you're not bouncing around from location to location to location, you know? And even if you do have a few locations, the way you're setting up your production schedule is, you know, you try to get everything at a time where you're going to the same location, then, you know, and you're just limiting, um, you know, the number of locations that you have to bounce around because that just means more sanitary, more risk you're running of people getting infected. And, and then, you know, that's why some of the low budget projects, um, uh, could be a bit more attractive because th they're inherently not going to have as many scenes and not as many people involved. Um, you know, so it is, it is thinking about those factors of, of reducing scenes and, or the number of people that ha are necessary for that scene and taking out, you know, some of those aspects, you know, that even if they do add to the film, finding another way to do it, uh, you know, being creative and, and reducing the footprint of the film um you know overall so you know and and like you know the, the i would say the investors were definitely you know financiers all around were on pause for the last two months i think people are now starting to say like okay and you know get back into the groove a little bit more you know um obviously you know the government is 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 issuing their reports yeah and then we're still kind of waiting on what the SAG and unions have to say, um, you know, un unfortunately it's, uh, for all of us, it's, it's, you're talking about an increase of about 15 to 20% of your normal budget. If you're, you know, um, 
to cover COVID related costs. Um, and, you know, even, even so, you know, going through the SAG signatory process is probably going to take, normally that could take, you know, look, I've, I've jammed it through in two weeks, even though SAG hated me when I did that, but, um, oh, well, uh, but, you know, there's normally the SAG signatory process can take mm, four to six weeks sometimes where now you should be planning more like at least eight weeks because it could take another three or four weeks for you to get clearance from SAG just because you got to, um, they have some COVID guidelines that you must follow. You know, you got to, you got to hire a COVID coordinator. Um, and that's someone who's had some specialized training in COVID related manners. That's a, a medical type personnel. So, you know, those are, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are going to be, a, you know, for the next year, year and a half that are going to be a bit different. And then hopefully, you know, as things start getting more under control, you know, we get a, you know, I, I think, some of that will, some of it will fade away and then some of it will just be everyday practice and we'll, you know, we'll get used to it, like taking our shoes off at the airport. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it, it's, don't get me wrong. It's not easy in the COVID world to, to go out and raise financing, you know, but I think doing smaller budgets, doing smarter projects where you're not bouncing around, you have less people involved in the overall sequences. Um, and, and, and like I said, anything that, uh, is more on a sound stage as to maybe out there in the open is, is also very helpful. Um, and that you can kind of correct and post or get more out of it in VFX world. So, um, just a few things. Michael, I'm checking back in with you. Are you seeing the chat questions or no? Oh, Michael, you're muted. <laughs> I'm saying yes, there is. Um, okay, so you're good on that. Um, because I'm kind of looking at our time as well. And you saw me kind of sneakily putting through our next couple of slides because y'all, we talked about these. When do we get sales agents involved? As soon as possible. Um, you know, then let me see. I like also to help with, you know, as we said, understanding with what is a realistic casting choice or a couple of choices. And then, you know, how is that going to play out both domestically and internationally? We covered it. I feel good. Uh, budget considerations, what's the realistic budget? Again, going back from, okay, well, how much is this going to be worth if we have John Travolta in it for international? Not eight million. Mm, go back and work back into that realistic, strikeable budget. I like how we went through that. Um, do we have anything we wanted to add on that or should I keep you know, scrolling along? I think everybody got it. We pretty yeah. much covered that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, and again, we've just been talking about this, the viability of the project. What are you, is everybody looking for before coming on board? We've been talking about that throughout the time. I feel pretty confident moving on. Do we feel good? Yes, excellent. Okay, and what should, <laughs> can and should content creators have prepared? I love this. We've done all of this already. We've been talking about it. Let's work on the, you know, investing financing deck. We've got our steps to do with that. Everybody's going to call Todd tomorrow between, what do you say, 10, 30, 11 o'clock? Does that work for you, Todd? <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get 200 phone calls tomorrow between 10, 30, and 11. We've all put it on our calendars. Actually, and then I those who appear after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get the automatic out-of-office email and everything, <laughs> you know. So, Joseph, we're scheduling you from 1 to 2. <laughs> You're going to have the coffee time from 3 to you know, 3.58. So that gives you the two minute window to, you know, go brush teeth or whatever we need to do before the next Zoom meeting, huh, you guys? Um, so I feel like we've, uh, Michael, do you see anything else in the questions we need to discuss? I think, you know, because we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, independent content creators, I really, Elsie asked something in the beginning, you know, and it might've been answered, maybe we just want to make sure we address it. Um, she says, outside of grants and fellowship programs, what are the, some practical ways first-time filmmakers can get investors, especially when they don't have connections? Oh, okay. Tell me more. Well, when you don't have connections, um, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it obviously makes it a lot harder. I, you know, my suggestion would be if you're a content creator, just create as much content as possible. And even if it's short five minute segments and just get it out there in the world in the, in the online and just try to draw as much attention to yourself 
and you know you you know you know there there are networking events you can try to look into that are that you know that come across here and there and and again it may be targeted not necessarily at a creative um you know like for instance uh, there's a group winston baker they put on a lot of of, of programs and events uh that are related to film and tv that have a lot of good people in there so it's it's going to those type networking events just trying to meet people again just creating content and just getting it out there to try to you know attract because you never know who you're going to get to watch your video and then they really like it and and you know that may be that connection um i've seen a lot of shorts that have influenced us in terms of making a movie somebody's done a really brilliant short even if they're doing a movie it's a different subject but this was the short first time the director did a short and it was impressive that can sway things it and also helps with talent because then they can look at something the guy's done and if it's really quite good then it, it's it's uh quite, you know it's surprising how that happens and raising 10 grand for shorts you know that is from grandma's credit card hmm. but people do it and they pull off nice nice movies that are impactful in moving the thing forward and Todd, something we discussed briefly in email, and you had mentioned previously, is the use of ripomatics um, and their potential effectiveness, both for an actual project, you know, for pre-sales, uh, but also I'm wondering, is that something that you like to see as far as, you know, hey, look, instead of a short film, look, I did this ripomatic to discuss. Hey, we're, we're, we're in a visual business. So mm -hmm. if you don't know how to put together and have someone edit, whether you edit yourself or whether you have a friend who's really good at editing, help you put together something that somehow shows how cool your project is, there's a variety of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And and the what, what we talked about, and I sent you, I think yeah. I sent you a link to one that we were looking yeah. at. That, that that project's still trying to get off the ground and that's like a 20 million dollar movie mm -hmm. but the director put together this reel and then pulled actual lines from the script and got someone who has a great vocal uh narration to to give the lines while they're doing these images from other movies and it was quite impactful as you saw right it's like wow this is that looks cool looks like it's gonna be a real badass movie mm -hmm. so when you're selling a 20 million dollar action thing that's like a real high concept like that that helps a lot there are a variety of places that do that if it's hokey though, you can shoot yourself in the foot. So you need to, don't be afraid, and you know, as create, at content creators, you gotta be not afraid to share all of these things that you're doing with a bunch of people. Bother your friends and your neighbors and get responses and then smartly adjust it and do some things and then put it in front of industry people, whoever you know, and mm -hmm. say, hey, what do you think of this? Even if they're in a related industry, whatever. Get a lot of feedback. Be ready to take some, some shots to get it good and fine tune it, and then you'll have success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, edit, only present what you feel really confident about. It's okay not to have all of the answers, but whatever information you're sharing with a potential partner, an investor, an actor, whoever, it's like it should be projected with confidence and you should be able to back it up. Like if you don't have a huge VFX background, then don't and you're making a vfx movie on a tiny little budget that's going to be problematic but if you're making something that's super ambitious and you have a vfx background and you can somehow show that then that can be a huge selling point like people want to feel confident that you can actually achieve what you're going for and whether it's a rip reel or a short if you can it doesn't have to look exactly like what you're going for but it needs to have that feel it needs to project what your vision is and everything you present should project that vision confidently if it doesn't just don't, don't show it because <laughs> it can definitely um work against you yeah can i just say joseph i know you were mentioning winston baker some people are asking can, is there like a link or an information you could just put maybe in the chat or into the q a that would help out yeah um, let's see if i can find yeah, and then another question jen is and i think this one's really helpful for everyone since yeah. everyone's talking about budgets and budget numbers, you know, and particularly you have a lot of people who are just starting out, you know, and they're like, well, I don't have the experience of looking at five, 10, 50 different projects to understand what works, what doesn't. Is there a place where you can actually get an idea of actual budget numbers, you know, for certain films? You know, that's what Hope is asking. Where do you get, where can you get actual budget numbers of similar films? You know, is there a place that has something like that or is it really just based upon the experience? 
you know. And, I've, I've never seen um, a place online or anything like that that lists, some budgets are listed in IMDb Pro, they'll put a budget there, but half of those are, are BS. And um, because I've even seen budgets from, from movies that I'm involved with that not even, they're not right, but it doesn't really, you know, in other words, the budget is something that's protected and, and, it, and it's usually not something that's given out freely because there's a value and it's perceived value. So if I'm making a movie and I'm selling it and I need to raise internationally, I need to clear the bar of $6 million, I can't go out and try and sell it as a $6 million movie. It's gotta be presented as a 10 million, which technically it's gonna be close to that by the time we get tax credits, incentives, and some other things. Like the overall strikeable budget might be nine six, but I have to clear six in cash, so I've got to push that. So in other words, the budgets, no matter if it's a studio or anywhere else, and when they say it's one hundred fifty million dollars or two hundred million dollars, um, you know who knows what it really is. That's a it's a perception thing. So when it comes to budgets, and Joseph will tell you this, anytime I'm looking at a movie, I can guess within, I'll tell you, a 10, 15 percent of of what the budget is just by what's on screen and how it's put together and what it looks like. And that's just from 25 years of looking at every single movie ever made, I think. But it's like, you know, that's kind of how it goes. And so someone asked the question in there, and they said, how do they look at something? I think it was uh, Violet. She said, how does a sales company evaluate a movie's worth by looking at it or whatever, there's some place, you know, or something in the synopsis that tells them, I mean, Right away, these are things that we see. Someone comes with a movie with a couple of attachments and they go, we're making this movie for five million. It's like, whoa, you, that's never gonna clear that hurdle out of the world based on the cast that you've got attached. Um, or they say, you know, we wanna do this for 10 million or seven and a half or whatever. Um, and sometimes they'll even say, and we have you know, a deal in place for a million and a half for domestic. And it's like, we're trying to get six out of four and off Matt Dillon. Uh, that's probably not happening not in a drama. I mean, this isn't going to work. So you try and help them understand. It's just that those are things that instinctively you generally know. There are other ones that I'm not sure. I mean, we do a lot of Bruce Willis. You had Tim on last week. Mm -hmm. I think it was last week. Maybe it was two weeks ago. On yes, the last weeks one. Back, yeah. So Tim, it works with Emmett Furlow Oasis. So we do a lot of their films sell overseas. So Bruce Willis is in a number of those pictures. Um, and sometimes it's another action guy or it's, you know, Nick Cage or whatever. Those have a certain value. Um, and I can tell you with a surety, the value of those kind of has been ticking down over time. So, you know, five years ago, Bruce Willis used to get you this out of all of international. Now it gets you this, you know, it, and it went down, it's gone down. So now it's a certain thing. Well, they back into the, those budgets. They don't still try to make it for, you know, $15 million. They're, they're tacking them down. So now it's, you know, 10 or it's nine and a half or whatever makes sense for the budget and where they're shooting and the tax credit, same thing. They're doing it on a bigger scale, but they're doing the same thing we're suggesting you guys do, which is back into the right size budget for what you have um, and understand what that, where that, where that gets you. So sales companies just kind of evaluate also whether it's a drama, they're tough to sell in foreign, it's execution dependent, like Amanda said, like those are, the art house players, you know, they can be brilliant and there are many. And believe me, I love those films. It's nothing to do with that. But the real meat and potatoes of the business is sort of action genre, sci fi, things that translate on a broader scale. So, and sales agents will tell you what the value in the marketplace is and give you an idea of that. And then a line producer can help you with a budget, like talk to a line producer and get a budget. I have actually almost never been presented with a budget that was the budget I ended up shooting the movie for because I will look at the script and be like, yeah, that's not what your budget is. You <laughs> think it's five, it's really three, and then we're gonna take the tax credit off. Like, you know, like you, you people who have just done this for a while will have a better idea and you don't have to have all the answers, but if you either know a line producer or you have a little bit of money to pay a line producer to do a budget so you can have a realistic sense because as a writer, you're not going to necessarily know all of that. Um, that's helpful. Absolutely. I don't think I've ever seen um, a producer bring a project with the budget in place and then we shoot it for that. It's yeah. always <laughs> adjusted for reality and for every other thing. I mean, it's a fluid scenario. So 
don't lose hope, but just, you know, and not being connected. Don't all assault us because we're trying to give you some advice, but reach <laughs> out to everyone you know and and ask people stuff and, and, and you know, bug them a little bit, but figure it out. We all figured it out. We're all, we're not, we didn't just fall in here. It's been working years through all of this to get here. So it doesn't just happen. It does occasionally, but not very often, just like overnight. You just got to keep pushing and keep bugging and ask questions and find out what people do and ask, you know, You'll, you'll find your way. They always do. The good ones do. Oh, you guys, see, Todd, you just gave me the perfect line to end this on. Alas, you guys, it's a moment of sadness. It's time. I've been given the five-minute warning like a minute and a half ago, but I kept wanting to listen, so I, I was ignoring writer's guilt. Sorry, Dustin. Sorry, you know. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Michael, let's put the link up. Take our survey. So you can, you know, tell us how fabulous we are, we hope. And that will help us get, you know, sponsors and all those good things so we can keep doing these, y'all. Um, Michael, do we have the link up? I'm putting it, yep, right there. Yay! So, and again, do the survey within the next few days, but ideally tonight. And, you know, you too could win an opportunity to get Final Draft, either a full download or a mobile app. We'll be giving away two of each of those. And then please follow us on social media, everybody. Get on our email list if you're here on the panel or if you're here following our panel today. That's right, we're gonna add you to the email list. Woo, cross it off, done, baby. Um, then after that, as we know, shout out to Writers Guild Foundation and the final draft. And ladies and gentlemen, I just, I wish we could do this all night long. We could keep going. We have so many questions, so much wonderful advice. A humongous thank you to Amanda Marshall, Cold Iron Pictures. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Joseph Lanius, lawyer and student. international expert at everything. Woo! And my partner in crime, Michael Fizz. Woo! And our moderator, Jennifer. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You guys, it's, I, I'm so fortunate. I get to learn so much from all of you amazing people. I'm just, oh, I'm so glad this is recorded so I can go back and take some notes now. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank Very you. Fun. And, you know, let's, let's do this again soon, please. <laughs>